All right. I see the numbers climbing, which means Zoom is letting people in the door. Welcome to another uh, fantastic installment of Big If True, which is the seminar series we run over at the Shorenstein Center on Media, Politics, and Public Policy. Um, I am Joan Donovan, the Research Director over at the Shorenstein Center at the Harvard Kennedy School. And today we have a very, very special panel with folks who have been living and breathing conspiracies uh, as journalists and researchers over the last, uh, well, some of us longer than others. Uh, but nevertheless, it is, uh, a, we have a deep, deep bench of knowledge here. And so today we're going to be talking about uh, deeper states and the proliferation of network conspiracies. And we can talk a little bit about what we mean by networked, because it's different than uh, conspiracies potentially that you've heard of in the past, like the moon landing was uh, a Hollywood set. We all know that was true, uh, et cetera. So, you know, there's, there's something though interesting and different about what happens when people are able to interact with and help shape a conspiracy through the internet. Uh, perhaps we might even revisit some themes around 9-11 and the documentary Loose Change as we're talking about, well, what is it that um, is so interesting about discussing conspiracy theories when <laughs> there are plenty of facts out there that we could be discussing, uh, but somehow, some way, conspiracies seem to grab us and hold on to us uh, in different ways, and I think and I think it also just is, they're just much more interesting than the truth. We are going to be, um, you know, uh, I, I will do my best to integrate your questions. If you post them in the Q&A over here, I'll take a look at them. And if they're not too trolly, I will uh, integrate them into our, our talk today. Uh, and if they are trolly, then that's your fault. Uh, I, don't own, I don't have ownership over that anymore. I had to give up caring about moderating the chat a long time ago. That's all being said, today we have, um, well, we'll start off with my left brain here, Brian Friedberg, who's a research, uh, senior researcher uh, at the Technology and Social Change Research Project here at Shorenstein, where he's been blending academic research and open source intelligence techniques uh, as an investigative ethnographer. And, for the most part, he's been focusing on the impacts of alternative media, anonymous communities, and unpopular cultures, to say the least, uh, on po uh, political communication and organization. And Brian and I work closely and extensively together. Um, <laughs> uh, just, yeah, it's almost weird sometimes when we're both seeing and thinking the same things, um, which is why I'm very excited to announce today that um, Brian and I, along with Emily Dreyfus, are going to be writing a book about meme wars that is might actually see the light of day next spring. What? That means I don't have a life between now and when that draft is due. Uh, second up, but not least, is Brandy Zadronsny, who's an award-winning investigative reporter uh, for NBC News, uh, where she covers misinformation, extremism, all things internet, uh, which is kind of becoming a joke in our field, I think, because uh, just because things happen on the internet doesn't necessarily mean they're part of this um, weird world that we are investigating. Uh, she's written many definitive stories on the QAnon conspiracy and the Trump propaganda outlet, the Epoch Times, and as well as uh, has really been at the forefront of the uh, rising anti-vaccination movement and coronavirus misinformation online. Um, someone asked me the other day about um, who is just unbelievable at getting the story when it comes to medical misinformation. And I proudly told that person from the WHO that it's Brandy. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't know anybody that really um, puts the time and energy and effort uh, into the long game here. And that's what I love about uh, Brandy's reporting is it, it really, um, it tells a story, but it, it doesn't just do it one off. 
she's consistently going back to, um, let's just say, the scene of the crime. And last but certainly not least, we've got David Rode, who works at a, a very small outlet, local, very tiny, you probably never heard of it, the executive editor at the, the New Yorker. Dot com. If you haven't been to a website before, it's a dot com. You probably don't know about that yet, but that's what that's where you're going to find that. Uh, he's also a former investigative reporter and foreign correspondent at another local outlet, uh, the New York Times, uh, as well as the Christian Science Monitor and Reuters. He's covered the wars in Afghanistan, Iraq, and on Bosnia, and he's a two-time winner of the Pulitzer Prize. I've won it none times. So two is better than none, but a girl can dream. And he was awarded for team coverage of Afghanistan and Pakistan for stories that helped expose uh, the Serbienka massacre during the war in Bosnia. And he's the author of four books, including the most recent that I have here, uh, In Deep, the FBI, the CIA, and the truth about America's quote unquote deep state. And so it's with all of this that I uh, welcome you enthusiastically to Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, the catering is great. And uh, welcome to, to uh, Big If True. Um, today, I really want to kick off by thinking a little bit about um, the long road to here, which is I think one of the things uh, in our field that we have to reckon with is there is a uh, pre-January 6th internet and world of conspiracy and a post-January 6th internet and world of conspiracy where uh, it is now undeniable, at least in the U.S. lens, that things that happen online do affect us in meat space. Uh, for a long time, people were content to say, well, that happened somewhere else. That's, that's over in the Philippines or that's over in Russia. But what January 6th really introduced us to is the problem of uh, mass network conspiracy where uh, a, a good deal of folks thought that the election had been rigged and were willing to um, try to topple the Capitol uh, in an effort to prevent a certification of the votes. It was a weird day. Uh, I was in touch with Brian and I were in touch with Brandy nonstop trying to understand what was going to happen next. Uh, often very fearful for friends and colleagues that were covering uh, the, the events. And I'd love to start by just getting a quick reaction from the three of you about if you could say maybe one thing that changed in the way you think about the world or the internet or politics um, that shifted with January 6th, or maybe nothing shifted, maybe this just felt like a culmination. Uh, and I'll start with you, David. Um, thank you. I'll, uh, I'll go with the world option there. And thank you for having me on with Brian and Brandy and you, John, I admire all your work and I'm kind of the old fuddy-duddy in, in this crew. So I'm going to embrace that though. <laughs> Please. Um, it, in my view, um, January 6th changed. Uh, I mean, I'd, I'd already realized this wasn't true, but it, you mentioned like I covered these wars long ago in Bosnia and Afghanistan and I watched conspiracy theories in like Bosnia kind of create a horrific war. Like, oh no, you know, they're, these killings aren't happening and the two sides would keep going. And then in Afghanistan, like the Taliban were just convinced 9-11 was staged and, and there, you know, it was all an effort to send U.S. soldiers to, you know, Muslim countries. And I um, didn't, I, I, I stupidly, arrogantly, um, I've written about this, thought that our institutions were stronger, that conspiracy theories couldn't lead to kind of violence here. Let, let alone an effort to reverse the outcome of a presidential election on live, you know, online and on, you know, live cable TV. But it, we are no different. I'm really worried about our future. And that's, I always knew we were no different. It was silly, but I, I the depths of our problems are, are, is deeper than I realized. That's what January 6th showed me. 
Yeah, I think I I was I still have moments of can't happen here. I think that's one of the the difficult things of uh, living in a country that does see itself as an, an exception is that when you live here, it's it's hard to deconstruct that kind of thinking, no matter how much education or experience uh, we have. Brandy, how are you doing? Yeah, um, I'm good. Thanks for having me on. Um, I, you know, adore you guys, um, you and Brian and David, I'm a big fan. So I'm really pleased to be here with you today. Um, you know, I think in terms of what changed in me, I, I, I very much, um, I just sort of, I have that same feeling of, I, I still am remembering watching you know somebody the live streams i had like 10 live streams up and my husband and i share a desk now and so it was just like my adhd adhd brain worked fine this way but like 10 live streams up and i was just like watching everything and he was like feeling pretty traumatized but you could just see people you know taking out knives and breaking through um certain portions of the capital and like climbing barricades and it still felt even it was as it was happening it was like how could this be happening? Like, is like, it just, it felt surreal. And I think nothing really changed in me from that. Like we had seen and heard these people saying that they were gonna do this for weeks. Um, but what I think changed is it feels like everybody else in, in my newsroom and, um, and surrounding newsrooms like the production side and the television side have all changed a lot. Um, they are all, uh, I don't want to use the term, they, they have had their own awakenings. And so, you know, what a couple of, what a year ago producers would say, I'm never putting that on television. Now those producers and others like them are coming to me and saying, what's happening with QAnon? Or what's happening, you know, with the militias or what's happening with et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, I, that actually concerns me more, I think, than them not listening to us originally because I think that there is a, um, there's a danger in giving too much airspace to um, what happened on the 6th and giving too um, much oxygen to these smaller communities. You know, QAnon has now been uh, relegated to really fringe sites and Brian knows a lot more about this even than I do, but like, I think, like I haven't reported on QAnon six, since the 6th and I, I, I just, I worry about our over um, amplification of these fringe online communities. No, I, I yeah, I echo that, and also uh, plus one the idea that we do need to move on at some point, especially when um, the people that were more central to that uh, conspiracy, that network conspiracy, are also moving on. But it is, there is something about uh, lurid curiosity that brings people back to it. Um, Brian, we just, we haven't seen each other today. So <laughs> how are you? <laughs> well, um, I would say that uh, from my research perspective, looking at a lot of the groups who were part of the siege and or were watching the siege from afar, um, the siege was a, a, a great reset, to use a, a phrase that's very popular within their communities about what is possible uh, going forward, both uh, in physical space and in online organizing. Um, a lot of the even small platforms that hosted some of the alt-right figures or QAnon influencers who were removed from YouTube or major social media platforms uh, in stages over the last year, uh, they even found themselves dislodged from some of these alt tech platforms. Um, a new sort of standard has been set about what's acceptable to talk about and what needs to be relegated to dog whistle as far as um, evangelizing, sure, but also in community maintenance and media for the community, not necessarily things that are meant to be uh, spread virally like the pandemic documentary, um, but things that meant something to these folks before QAnon came along and will certainly mean something after 
January 6th is a year plus away from us. No, and I, I appreciate that. And I think one of the things that our research team has has been able to do over the years is just roll through and kind of watch these truth or communities develop and then they coalesce around a set of keywords and then the keywords shift, but sometimes we're stuck in a different, you know, sometimes it's our methods of reporting, sometimes it's the fact that we're not watching for adaptations that keep us in this in this world. But like Brandy, if this is the last time you have to tell a story about the origins of QAnon, make it a good one for us. I know that um, for some of the people that are are tuning in here, uh, they get it. Uh, you know, they've heard the whole like, oh, it's a bunch of weirdos on the internet that think there's a deep state cabal that are pedophiles and Satanists. Like, give us the actual story. Like, who were the grifters and how did they make it? Uh, how did they make this conspiracy uh, into profit? And how did that drive uh, uh, this almost like a disinformation industry uh, that, that then became a political uh, tool? I'll never ask you to talk about QAnon ever again after this, I promise. Great. Um, several white men are writing books now, so you can <laughs> get the history from them. I will ask them. them for the... But I, you know, you've been writing about this a long time. You know yes. where this comes I'll from. I'll take you on my journey with QAnon. Please. So once upon a time that still exists today, there were some terrible websites where um, uh, people went, young men mostly, went to be racist and um, trade in terrible memes. And um, one of the genres of these websites, 4chan, and then 8chan was to pretend that you were a government insider with secret knowledge of some sort of mission or activity. There was a CIA anon, and it borrowed language from the anonymous movement, right? So there was CIA anon, there was FBI anon, there was White House anon. And the genre of this like LARPing really was to say, I am White House anon and I have this secret information about what's going on in the White House. And then sometimes people um, on 4chan would play along and sort of get caught up in this and it was a fun little game. And sometimes they would just sort of call you out and say, you're full of it. And then one day um, in October of 2017 came um, QAnon. QAnon for his Q clearance, eventually we learned, um, his secret Q clearance. And so um, QAnon started revealing these like really uh, weird clues, these sort of, um, it felt like a, a, I don't know, like coded messaging, right? It was like Mockingbird dash dash bracket bracket, where is Huma? Follow Huma. And um, what they alleged was that Hillary Clinton was going to be arrested soon. She was already in custody and she was gonna get in big trouble. It borrowed a lot as the you know weeks went on from the Pizzagate conspiracy. And what it alleged generally was that um, Democratic politicians and the Hollywood elite and um, Jews and, um, you know, lots of other uh, folks were all in the secret cabal that ruled the world and what they love to do for power with how they got their power and harnessed their power or youth or whatever their power um, was rooted in was through the sacrificing of children. Um, and they would drink the blood and uh, scare the kids beforehand and it would release this thing called adrenochrome supposedly. And that is how they got their fountain of youth, fountain of power or whatever. Um, so this was all very silly, very stupid. Um, we were watching it as it was happening because it was a sort of popular post on the site. Um, but then what really happened was um, a couple of wannabes. Um, there was a Tracy Beans, she was a YouTuber wannabe and she was long involved in the far right sort of liberty online radio movement. Um, and then there was this guy from, this board moderator from South Africa and this board admin from, um, that called himself pamphlet and on. And basically these people sort of um, garnered, they realized that something was going on quickly that like people were sort of liking this and they, um, decided to cross platforms. So they took 
the posts that were happening on 4chan and eventually 8chan, they moved them to Reddit, sort of built a community there. They moved it through Tracy Beans to YouTube and they started all these YouTube channels and got people excited and eventually to Jerome Corsi got people excited about decoding these ridiculous clues. Um, so it became sort of an influencer market where people would make YouTube videos saying like mockingbird means the media and you know uh, you know the brackets mean this and, and people started decoding, decoding these clues that were the, the end of these clues meant that there was going to be something called the storm there was going to be and also because Sorry, Donald Trump is very weird, right? So like during, at the end of 2017, all these like weird things would happen. Like no normal president would just stand in front or stand beside all of his military people and tell the, tell the media, the storm is coming. And so like, well, what does that mean? And so like these people had a weird conspiracy game on the internet, plus like this weirdo president to sort of link all these weird things together. And it became like this game, um, eventually not, to less than a year before it started, Reddit quickly noticed that like this is a sort of dangerous game. They were threatening to kill Hillary Clinton. They were doxing people on Reddit. And they, Reddit said, well, those people aren't allowed anymore. So we're gonna cut these communities off. So they closed Calm Before the Storm and other Reddit communities devoted to QAnon. And then Facebook welcomed them with open arms. And so the groups grew on Facebook exponentially and they got to people like tea partiers, you know, my dad, <laughs> folks like that who were just there to share pictures of their grandkids. And then the pandemic happened and a lot of people who were never online were suddenly online. And QAnon is really good at crossing platforms and crossing audiences. And it just sort of scooped everybody up and went insane. And that's what happened in 2020. And Facebook banned them and October 2020 and that's where we are today. Thank you so much for that. Um, I noted that there were some sound issues on my end. I tried to fix them. Are we sounding a little bit better or not? I can switch uh, if, if it's not working. Brian, is that sounding better to you or not as good? Okay, let me try something else. Um, we're just gonna, we're gonna troubleshoot as we go. How's that? Is that better, better, worse, better, worse? Um, okay, and yeah, that's the that's the best I'm gonna do on that. Um, okay, so David, now you know that QAnon was part grift, part coincidence, uh, a little bit of uh, 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 shenanigans. Um, but then also there was this technical component to it where the QAnon set of hashtags and the secretness of the society, it was almost like you were being told a secret uh, that once you knew it, you know, people describe it as an awakening, this uh, now that I know this, every time I see a pizza icon, it's not just pizza anymore. And you write, um, I'm just gonna read part of the book jacket because this actually really resonated with me. You write, to conservatives, the deep state is an ever-growing government bureaucracy, an administrative state that they think relentlessly encroaches on the individual rights of Americans. Liberals fear the military industrial complex of cabal of generals and defense contractors who they believe routinely push the country into endless wars. Every modern American president from Carter to Trump has engaged in power struggles with Congress, CIA, and the FBI. Every CIA and FBI director has suspected White House aides or members of Congress of leaking secrets for political gain. Frustrated Americans increasingly distrust the politicians, unelected officials, and journalists who they feel set the country's political agenda. American democracy faces its biggest crisis of legitimacy in half a century. I heard like all of that in what Brandy was describing. I, I could hear echoes of how it might uh, trip up conservatives, about how it might trip up the left, about how it might trip up uh, ordinary folks that just don't, you know, they know power exists, but they don't really know how it works. Can you help us understand what someone might even mean when they say the deep state? 
I'm sure it won't be as good as Brandy's uh, telling. Brandy, you never have to tell that story again. It was amazing. Uh, it's um, we you know this all happened uh, before. This this has happened over and over again in American history, but technology has you know amplified it, put it all on on steroids. So. You know, I had relatives that were reading every kind of JFK assassination uh, book. Um, and so, yeah, that, that there's, there, conservatives sincerely have always been suspicious of government. They're always afraid of this ever encroaching, you know, state, as you said, and then liberals fear the military industrial complex. Um, and the problem here too, and the, my, the first half of my book is a history, like the FBI has committed terrible abuses. You know, during the civil rights movement, they, you know, spied on and tried to smear Martin Luther King Jr. They also investigated right wing uh, groups like the John Birch Society, um, you know, post 9-11 massive surveillance abuses that Edward Snowden engaged in. And, and so, you know, there are these problems. We, and so there was many, many reforms um, enacted. It was this, something called the Church Committee that exposed all the bad things that the CIA and FBI did during the Cold War. Um, and they set up a whole mechanism to control the FBI and the CIA. Um, it's not perfect. There's congressional oversight. There's the FISA court, which is supposed to limit you know, their ability to do uh, eavesdropping on, on us as citizens. And, um, and I'll, I wanna keep answers short here. So it's not new and we should be skeptical in, of these very, very powerful government agencies that can spy us spy on us more effectively than they ever have in the digital age. But at the same time, the kind of explosion of disinformation and misinformation has led average Americans to be entertained by this or to really believe it. And uh, to go back to January 6th, I think many of them sincerely believe they were defending the country from this plot to steal the election. Um, so, a traditional problems, a, a healthy skepticism of government, a government that has carried out abuses, all getting amplified and exaggerated in an incredibly dangerous way um, online. And Brian, I'd love for you to chime in here about um, what you see from the vantage point of a researcher. One of the things that uh, we've talked about over the years is this idea baked into some of these um, unpopular subcultural communities, especially with the QAnon folks, this idea, we are the media now, right? So there's this relationship between not just, oh, we're a subculture, but they actually make their own news. They make their own connectivity. Um, sometimes YouTube acts like the infrastructure. Sometimes it's uh, the kind of force that brings ideas, new ideas into these groups. Can you describe a bit about that socio-technical relationship and environment between network conspiracy uh, type subcultures or truth or communities, or how, I don't wanna put words in your mouth about it, and this relationship they have to creating their own uh, customized content and how that interacts with how they view the mainstream media. Sure. I mean, technically, we're participating in that networked process right now as we talk about uh, the movement that does not like to be called QAnon. They prefer to be called an anonymous researchers or anons or however they want to say it. Where the news now really started to take shape within the Q community when they started getting lots of press. Um, lots of press that, unlike um, the excellent work of Brandy and um, so many of the other people who've been critically covering this beat um, from a social harms perspective and from a platform critical perspective, um, the sort of cultural interest in QAnon um, doesn't really have any material impact other than to generate more and more commentary. Uh, news about news about news. Um, the grand media spectacle of this sort of QAnon moment, um, the folks who have been um, most influential on the other side, um, the influencers who make media, the, who maintain networks, who do daily broadcasts and daily sort of interpretation, uh, they're not bound by the same editorial standards as journalism, yet they do consider themselves journalists um, quite often. Um, they're 
do your own research sort of mentality um, that comes from truther communities and conspiracy communities that have predated QAnon by you know generations. Um, the internet and what we would call open source intelligence makes their job a lot more fun. Um, and there's lots of historical research like into Bilderberg Group and the Trilateral Commission where it starts to deviate from simply uh, about the US state and the power of the US state but as well starting to poke into the fraying edges of neoliberal consensus. Um, and that media moment we're in where there's demand for this kind of content and there's alternative media that you can monetize critique of mainstream media content really helps to keep the cycle alive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially the monetization factor here that you know Brandy pointed out as well is that there's a lot of good money to be made uh, either by covering, um, you know, conspiracies online or contributing to them or, or just, you know, speculating on them. Of course, um, like all great internet conspiracies, it always seems to end in, uh, you know, anti-Semitism, right? Even when we talk about flat earthers, very quickly it devolves into anti-Semitism especially around the notion of they, like whoever they is and is in control supposedly, uh, you know, tends to have these, these much deeper roots. And Brian wrote an excellent article for Wired maybe a year ago now about adrenochrome and how that, um, that narrative took shape within QAnon. And um, it, yeah, Nicole, if you could throw that in the chat, I'm sure people would wanna read that. I wanted to ask though, and shift gears, because we have a couple of questions in the Q&A about um, thinking about these problems and then what to do about them. One of the things, David, that I think your, your work really shows us is that uh, there are long cycles of public distrust and distrust in journalism, distrust in the state. Uh, you even say that skepticism in uh, government can be a sign of health in a democracy. Explain yourself please. <laughs> Fair question. Uh, you know, journalists are less good at answering questions than asking them. Um, again, I, uh, the, the, my simple answer is that like the answer, um, in my, one of my simplistic answers or my main simplistic answer is more transparency, more transparency from the news media, more transparency from the CIA, more transparency, you know, from Congress. And um, that's not going to solve this. Uh, you guys have pointed out great ideas about amplifying this, and you know, Brandy talked about paying too much attention to it. Um, and I would, this is very retro, as I said in the beginning. Um, I'll use my pandemic example. This is very rudimentary, but um, the pandemic has taught us that there needs to be nonpartisan public health officials who are giving you know, the public, the best facts they can about how this disease spreads, how effective the vaccines are. And so uh, part of this, the, the sort of countering this, the conspiracy theories and everything is, I think, an embrace of nonpartisan public service, of people who are just getting up and presenting facts. Um, part of the Trumpian project, maybe it was a secret scheme to you know, create authoritarianism here or just an, a short-term effort by Trump to discredit rival sources of information was to attack you know, every government institution, uh, every you know, law enforcement investigation, and then you know, attack the CDC and then eventually you know, uh, uh, election officials across the country. And that, that's really dangerous and corrosive. But I think, again, the answer is um, more transparency more nonpartisan public service, more Tony Fauci's, if you will. I know people are tired of that that whole thing, but uh, and more nonpartisan journalism by journalists. And we should be really. Th there can be tons of opinion writing. That's great. And I'm giving you again my retro newspaper thing. But like, we have an opportunity now to kind of, um, you know, focus on facts, not exaggerate the importance of certain groups, and and um, kind of try to bring the temperature down and um, 
I guess, uh, be transparent, if that makes any sense. For just for fact finders, it's, like, obviously people who want to opine should opine. But I, again, I think transparency and facts are the best answer here. Yeah, and I, you know, as I've been spending this week uh, touring around Zoom after Zoom, trying to help people understand what might be going on on Thursday with these tech hearings, one thing I hear time and time again is, you know, the truth is never going to outpace a really great conspiracy, right? We we're kind of interested in palace intrigue, right? It's not, it's not, you know, the, the even early versions of what did well online was celebrity gossip. I don't know if anybody remembers Perez Hilton when he was uh, top of the charts uh, on, on the internet, but there does seem to be something about the way in which social media, the immediacy and the satisfaction of things that are outrageous, are novel, um, and we do see some of our, our journalists uh, tilting into that, sometimes on purpose, sometimes on airing on the side of a deadline, but also there's something about the gates being wide open with the internet at this stage. Uh, openness for me uh, has been a very difficult thing to negotiate in terms of a pain point, which is that uh, openness online used to be a virtue and now people who have huge networks and a good amount of cash can leverage that openness to purchase scale and then um, very quickly uh, ensure that they can shape reality uh, in real time. And I want to ask you, Brandy, because you've been doing this in the fray, um, publishing about disinformation, it's a weird beat. It's a different kind of beat. It's not the same kind of beat if you're covering, um, you know, uh, space technology or other kinds of, um, uh, you know, even crime or war. There's something weird about the disinformation beat. One, because I think technology is super cool. And so it's really hard to demystify because it's sort of feels like magic sometimes. And then the second part of it is, is the way that it's designed makes it really hard for us to get to the bottom of things quickly. And this gets to what Brian was saying about how there are anonymous researchers online who really enjoy that openness and the kind of uh, fact-finding mission you can find yourself on, uh, you know, at 2 a.m. on a Tuesday when someone's wrong on the internet. But for you as a journalist, how do you even make, like, how do you find facts in an environment like this where there's so many hidden um, groups and motives and and uh, ways of blending in? Oh, you're muted. There we go. Not anymore. I'm unmuted, yeah. baby. Um, so I, you know, I, I this beat is really interesting, but I've never covered a war and I've never been on the crime beat. I've always been on the internet beat. So I don't know if I can say it's, I don't know how it might be different from those beats because I've never been a journalist on those beats, I'll just say. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think that for me, there's like a formula and it's, it's harder because it's like, I, I think in other beats things happen, right? Like we get this daily digest of like things that are happening today from the AP and from our producers that say like, there's gonna be this court case going on. And then I assume that if you're a journalist covering that court, you go and you report on what's happening at that court. And then like that's, that's your day. And, but like, it's hard to tell when something on this beat is a story. So like there will be, months that I'll just sort of be watching a weird community and it's not a story and nothing happens because it doesn't rise to the level that like polite society should know about these folks. Um, it's, you know, the internet can be a bad place generally, especially the places that I sort of lurk in. And I, I don't think that like my audience is always like my parents, like why would I want my parents to know about this? Like what good would it do the world if like 
normal folks know about, you know, these sub communities that Brian is so entrenched in. Um, but, you know, it's also like a super fun beat because when you do lurk for a really long time, eventually like out of nowhere, you'll get some sort of clue that shows you that in fact, you know, the, the Steve or the, the Hunter Biden laptop case or the laptop narrative or claims are actually, you know, a Steve Bannon joint. And like you get little clues about this from other lurkers, from people who don't have very good OPSEC, but are like, that's how we did a lot of the QAnon stuff, but that, you know, people that don't have very good OPSEC, but are involved in these communities somehow give away the game. So I don't know. And I don't, maybe this is a meandering answer. I'm sure that it is because my brain is potatoes these days. But like, I do think that, you know, it's a, it can be a completely fun beat because the stories that I get to do are really a puzzle that start with like, there's this lie that's doing some sort of harm. And that like makes it, that breaks the tipping point, right? Like there's, there's a harm here and I can tell the harm and then I can use my like librarian detective skills to sort of find where the lie came from and tell a story about why someone's lying to you. And that's like very, um, very satisfying in terms of telling a story or being a journalist or, I mean, I love that part about it. What I don't love about it is the part of this beat that comes with, or the part that comes with this beat, which is like the endless harassment. And, you know, when you sort of shine a light on shenanigans that are happening online, then all of those people no longer focus on the lie that they're telling, they focus their shenanigans on you. And that stinks. It's, um, it's not great. It's not great at all, but um, so far, the first part of the beat um, that's so rewarding sort of um, tips the scales that way. Yeah, and Brian, I'd love for you to check in a bit because you tend to be my early warning system. You find out usually a, a few days ahead of time that you know people are starting to look at our research or starting to get closer to that. Um, you know, for the people listening, are there ways in which they should think about, hey, I see something suspicious on Twitter what might the next step be for them in terms of figuring out if it's uh, potentially a lie? You know, sometimes I just look at the same screen name across a different platform to see if they're, you know, gaming something. Um, but for you, can you describe a little bit of that process of open source intelligence that might be a, uh, a way for someone who doesn't know how to do what you do uh, just to be a little bit better at interneting? Um, look at the replies. You can usually find dissent within the replies, and that can help you find whether a screenshot of something that seems to trigger you in a negative or positive way might not actually be real. Um, sometimes, you know, the, the waiting for a fact check um, can take a couple hours usually, but um, there's a lot of folks that um, journalists and um, other people who sort of pay attention to the side of the internet that have pretty robust Twitter presences that are trying to, you know, keep the platform safe. Um, and the information that uh, tends to go viral uh, gets debunked before um, most mainstream press uh, can do it uh, organically sort of through the community. So you know, um, seeing who some of your favorite reporters are following and retweeting generally will help create a nice, uh, good network of fact checking that you can rely on. Yeah, and I definitely like a Jane over at BuzzFeed is someone who instantly when I, I think something suspicious, um, I, I will look and see if she's already been uh, tweeting about it. And uh, Part of her network, of course, is people that are telling her uh, that they see it too. And I think that uh, one of the things that these platform companies are gonna need to learn is that kind of agility, right? Uh, one of the ways in which we see conspiracy scale uh, is through the manipulation of Twitter trends, uh, through the manipulation of content tags on YouTube so that you can show up in places that your content really isn't even about. Um, and then of course, uh, you know, the old 
SEO strategies that we've seen uh, in order to try to get your content up higher in Google search returns. And then, um, you know, there's also the tactic of, of keyword squatting, especially on, um, on Facebook, the Facebook search uh, box can sometimes act, sometimes act as a rabbit hole. I know when people are trying to figure out how to donate to a campaign, it can be a pain if you start at Facebook because there's so many scams and grift uh, laced around different politicians' names. And so there's a lot of ways in which people can think about uh, unmasking and, and debunking and looking for fact checks. But I wanna wrap up around um, thinking through what a lot of people keep asking me and I don't ever really have a great answer for, which is, are we going to get through this? Is this a glitch? Is this a new normal? Is this something we have to reckon with? Is there a way? Uh, I don't think there's a way back. I'm, I'm gonna be very clear about that. But I know Brandy, you've been thinking about, are there other sectors, other folks we might tap on the shoulder and say, hey, why don't you come have a conversation with us? I know for me and you uh, both, that's been potentially like, you know, engaging with librarians. I married one, you are one, <laughs> you know. Uh, but are there other ways in which we should be thinking about the problem of network conspiracy? Not so much saying, oh, the platforms made the problem, the platforms have to fix it. But are there things that are front of mind for you that we should start exploring? as a community of people who care very deeply about the integrity of truth and information, um, not just online, but we live in a society. Um, so I really wanna hear David's answer with this because I, I feel like I'm, I mean, I'm 40 years old and, but like, I feel so much like I'm, I'm like running around like my, with my head cut off, like this is, this is important and this has never happened before. This is totally unique. This is crazy. It's in the internet, but it really makes me feel better hearing this has happened before. You know, it will happen again here. I like, I really appreciate that. So with that said, and with that hope in mind, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm basic much because of the harassment that I just discussed I am I'm sort of tired of constantly just outing liars and and you know holding platforms to account I think it's very important but I have been looking at the idea of solutions if they exist and I think that you know there are there's a potential for solutions within the platform um, we've seen that they can do stuff when they want to um, the fact is though if they really got rid of the problem um, in terms of like uh, network disinformation and um, conspiracy theories and hopeless information and all the problems that they have, then they wouldn't have a platform anymore. So, um, so I think I, I've been sort of looking towards outside agencies, whether this is, you know, the idea of disruptors in terms of not, I don't think there's going to be a new Facebook. I don't think that there's going to be a good Facebook, right? I think that what I'm looking towards are smaller, more local, more niche platforms that um, that have a highly moderated um, communities. I think we should pay these moderators. I think we need people like librarians to be around these internet communities and help people find the information that they need, help people find relevant um, information. Like when I was a librarian in Vermont, we had this great um, garden collection. And so not only could you have like, we had a great gardening collection of books, but we also held meetups for gardeners. And we also would had seed libraries. So you can come and check out seeds and you could go and plant them in your garden. You could also check out garden tools. So like for a small subset of a community, that was everything, right? And that did that job. I think the problem is that like, we look, so many people look to Facebook for everything that it becomes, you know, and it's not just Facebook, but like it, it becomes sort of dangerous in a myriad ways instead of just, you know, a single way. Um, that's a roundabout answer, but like, and then, you know, I also have a lot of faith in people doing the job of media literacy. So this is librarians teaching, you know, boomers 
information literacy classes. This is, you know, um, University of Washington did a misinfo day with high schoolers the other day, thousands of high schoolers across the country learning about misinformation and then going home and taking those lessons home to their parents. Like, I think that there's a sort of, there's gotta be some meeting in the middle of, of disrupting platforms and people learning enough to log off and learning enough to understand what they're gonna get when they do go on these larger platforms. I have no faith in the platforms themselves. And I should say, you know, uh, the work that uh, there's a recent article out by Claire Wardle and Whitney Phillips about Hollywood and disinformation that I just love. And I know that Whitney has been working with, um, a, you know, uh, folks in Syracuse about uh, teaching at the, the high school level uh, more about disinformation in particular. And, and I think, you know, from my perspective, when we talk about journalism and the future of it, I think we do need to be teaching this in J schools, as well as the, you know, we do workshops on workshops at, at Shorenstein for anybody that wants to, to dig into this stuff. But I, I'm, I'm not going to let you go from the beat. I want this beat to develop into something around a tech watchdog beat, not just, you know, I see you know, London, I see France, I see something wrong on Facebook, um, you know, and, and develop into something serious where we can have advocacy and journalists uh, in better conversation with each other, especially related to the kinds of um, harassment that make burnout so high on this beat, which is to ask uh, Old Man Road here, uh, what do you think? Like, you know, what, what do we do now that we've got your book? Do we call Congress up and say, hey, we need a commission here? Like, can, can you make this, uh, you know, like what kind of investigation would Congress need to do? Uh, is it something that we need a, a task force about? Like, wh where do we go? Um, the problem is the old guys first. Uh, and uh, um, I, um, I think the, our, the, our government has, and this happens again, but Brandy, thank you for saying it, it, this does happen over and over again. There is hopes and I'll, I'll end on, on the hopeful stuff, but you know, it's, and this is obvious to all of you, but our political process has abjectly failed to keep up with the digital age. We have this giant unprecedented, you know, privately owned communication system that's been built with no rules of the road, no, no, you know, no, no guardrails, no punishment for the horrific harassment that Brandy and John, that everybody, you know, experiences. Um, so I think there's a lot of things to, to a lot of efforts to make, like you've talked about, but I do think um, Congress needs to do something like this is about government and the people we represent. There's um, privacy is a huge issue that you know, some of these younger uh, people that have been elected to Congress on the, on the right, as I talked out in the beginning of the hour, like there's a deep fear on the right about big companies you know, uh, you know, vacuuming up the, all of our personal data. And there's a big fear on the left about that also. So I don't know, um, I don't have perfect answers in terms of the legislation. I think generally concentrations of power are dangerous and bad. That's happened over and over in American history. Um, I'm not, I don't I don't have an answer like we break up the platforms, but it's putting pressure on Congress to address this, to come up with rules of the road for the digital age, to, you know, um, when can the FBI, you know, encryption, when can a cell phone be searched? Like we've avoided this now for 20 or 30 years. And I think there's a public appetite now for us to address it. And look, back to my example, the church reform in the late 70s, um, you know, January 6th that it makes it, um, and, we've, and we've had a pandemic and, and a million other things, but, you know, most Americans felt that the government was broken. You know, the Vietnam War had happened, 50,000 Americans had died, you know, hundreds of thousands of Viet Vietnamese. Uh, the FBI was opening Richard Nixon's mail. John Lennon was being surveilled uh, as a Vietnam War protester. And no one believed in any American institutions in the late 70s, but there was these raft of reforms I've mentioned that were created and it divided power. You know, it gave Congress all this power to oversee the FBI and the CIA. 
it created more transparency for the press that had these courts. The FISA court's been a failure that needs to be completely revamped. But I just wanna say that there was another a younger generation that faced this kind of crisis and they responded to it. And just one specific example, Jimmy Carter put the deputy director of the FBI on trial for breaking into the houses of relatives of the weathermen, the 1960s you know, radical group. And the deputy director of the FBI was convicted. So radical things have happened in this country. Um, our system is, is rickety, but I'm sort of convinced that you know, we can address this. And lastly, I, this is just a silly thing, but when I write a story, I, I think this issue of amplification online, everybody can say anything they want online and I love it and I don't want it. We can't censor the internet. You guys know that better than me, but you don't have an inherent right to have something amplified by a platform. And there's something there about, I don't know, the platforms are pressuring them. And I think it's crazy that when, you know, I, when we publish a piece in the New Yorker, we can get sued. We smear somebody, we libel them. There are consequences for when we say things. And I don't know how you apply that. You shouldn't apply that obviously to everybody on the web, but it's just crazy that there's kind of no responsibility. So anyway, there's a lot of different ways to attack this, but I'm absolutely convinced that, you know, this generation can rise to this challenge and we can get through this phase um, together somehow. I I love that. And I think that that's um, exactly where mentally I want to be, but also Brian and I are deep in the thick of this and we know it's not over uh, by a long shot, which is to say that if we don't change the chessboard or, you know, like if we don't change the players and move things around when we um, uh, got a shot, the, the future could be terrible. Um, and I say that with all the love and in, in, in my heart, but I would love Brian for you to say a little bit about what you were thinking and reflecting on as Brandy and David um, were talking about what potentials there might be for folks from other sectors or the role of Congress, you know, maybe you could chime in about the role of research and where research might need to go in order to address this really heady problem. I mean, there's a simple matter of history and how shoddy the history of this side of the internet really is. Um, you know, what are the the people who are keeping track? You know, and what in what context is that track kept in? You get um, some older institutions like uh, the wikis and like the Know Your Memes that try to help keep this side alive, but the origins of a lot of the things that. Um, materially make up some of these sort of conspiracy movements or truth or movements, um, the provenance of where they came from and who's responsible, et cetera, just aren't really there. It gives everything an eph ephemerality and um, the abuse of platforms is most effective by those with the lightest amount of personal identification. Um, so the, the, the expectation that this sort of informa information environment can lead us back to consensus politics um, is a fantasy, um, no matter how much regulation is applied to it, uh, particularly because, you know, you see sort of um, the gamification of political ID online, um, you know, the, the stories that go around Twitter, if I was a teenage Nazi, and now I'm a Marxist, and you know, this sort of play that keeps these communities alive, not just their work, but their play. Um, uh, this is, you know, part of internet subcultural identity. Um, every platform has its own sort of subcultural qualities. Some of them are just sort of deemed socially harmful right now. Um, a lot of these were not deemed socially harmful before, like rampant anti-blackness and misogyny on most of these platforms. Um, and it takes institutional work to do it. Um, and, you know, you can look at the groups that have helped to bring equity back into the conversation around who these platforms are actually for. Um, if we do not approach that systemically and look at these ideas as social health, um, they'll never be fixed. I, yeah, I agree with you. You know, when we, when we embark on research and our um, team, we've been thinking a lot about how to research network conspiracy without uh, adding to the amplification problem, as well as doing more to reveal 
the structure and the technical systems that undergird and support uh, the network making of these uh, groups as well as the profit motives. And one of the most insidious aspects of this is that these groups can be mobilized. That's the one piece that I think I want people to take away from our conversation today is that um, you don't end up with uh, folks like Marjorie Taylor Greene in the same way that she shows up in public without a very robust online community that she's engaging with like QAnon. Um, and the form and norm of our political communication has been forever changed by the way that platform companies distribute information. And I am um, an ardent and big defender of free expression online. But David, as, as, as you've pointed out, and as Brandy, we've worked on for years, um, the amplification question is really at the forefront of uh, where we need to think and grow and investigate so that we can be prepared for uh, the next big conspiracy. And I will say that, you know, in closing, Thursday is going to be interesting. There's going to be this tech hearing. Uh, Congress is preparing to question Pachai and Zuckerberg and Dorsey. And there's going to be a lot of hand wringing about alternative platforms like Gab and Parler. But Gab and Parler are not capable of doing the kind of amplification work that Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter have done over the last decade. And so it's gonna be really important that we, uh, as a community of researchers and journalists and uh, policy makers and uh, you know, people from Harvard Kennedy are in cybersecurity, they're in, they're in the military. Uh, it, it's gonna take even um, you know, folks from civil society to keep their eye on what really matters here. Because if we do get just too distracted with some of these fringe conspiracies or too distracted by the role that alternative platforms are going to play in the next um, round or iteration of what sometimes feels like information warfare, uh, we are, we're going to constantly be like cats chasing our tail, right? I mean, that's not the image that most people think about when they think about a dog, but here I am, a lesbian with a couple of cats, just on a Tuesday afternoon riffing with my friends. So um, I say that all to say to everybody, it can get better, but we, we actually have to try. And we have to try uh, together. And I'm really looking forward um, to continuing the conversation. And David, when I get a chance, I will buy you some donkeys and we will uh, continue this conversation because I got a lot of questions. Brandy, you know how to reach me and Brian, I'll be texting you in 10 minutes, I'm sure. And for everybody else, I will see you on the internet. Peace.